Hi, everyone. I'm Judy, the YouTube lawyer. Today's legal live stream show brings us a special guest, Nathan Fox, who is a professional LSAT instructor and teacher. He scored an almost perfect score on the LSAT and is a graduate of Hastings College of Law. So let's welcome Nathan Fox to the stream. Hi, Nathan. Hey, Judy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for um, thanks for agreeing to be on the show. I mean, it was fun talking with you and Ben Olson on on your channel. So it's nice to collaborate. Yeah, you, we got great feedback from that podcast episode. I hope people will go listen to it. Yeah. OK, well, um, would you like to first start out by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you wound up going to law school? Oh, uh, well, accidentally, really, I um, so I was a GMAT teacher and my employer at the time needed an LSAT teacher. And so they paid me to take the LSAT and I uh, <laughs> did. And I got a 179 and immediately was teaching LSAT in San Francisco. I then I had like a day job that I hated and I loved teaching. I fell in love with teaching LSAT and just kind of stupidly, honestly, went to law school um, without really much of a plan. Um, it was easy for me to get in with my 179. I overpaid for law school, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, I <laughs> I graduated from Hastings, but I, I didn't really get much out of law school, unfortunately, because I just shouldn't have been there in the first place. Yeah, I didn't know any lawyers and I didn't, it wasn't really like a good fit for me. But I fell even more in love with teaching LSAT. And I started my business while I was in law school. Uh, it was called Fox LSAT for a long time. And then I met Ben and we started the Thinking LSAT podcast. That was like seven or eight years ago now. And now everything that we do is at LSATdemon.com. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah, just totally backward fell into the life of a, an LSAT teacher. Nobody grows up uh, wanting to be an LSAT teacher. Oh, well, how interesting. No, it actually yeah. sounds a lot more fun than practicing law because I've taught the LSAT <laughs> myself before. So if I could make really good money as an LSAT instructor, I would probably prefer to do that. Ben and I both agree. Yeah, we, we both graduated from law school and we, we both could have practiced and we both made very different decisions because we just love teaching. Um, the LSAT is like just a perfect fit for both of us. It tests English and logic and how hard you can work. And it makes perfect sense to us. And it's really like a treat. Um, I know it sounds weird. I'm weird for sure. <laughs> but it's a treat to be able to explain it to people because it just, you know, I, I really do believe that it, it makes perfect sense if you make sense of it. And yeah. uh, that's what we do. Okay. Yeah. So um, by the way, where did you grow up? Like, where do you call home? I grew up in a tiny little town called Ripon, R-I-P-O-N, in the Central Valley of California. It's the self-proclaimed almond capital of the world. Oh, I've never heard of it, even though I live <laughs> No, in nobody has ever heard of it. <laughs> and you have no reason to ever go there. It's just on Highway 99, uh, you know, it's like in between um, Stockton and uh, Modesto. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. okay. Two yeah, other people places mostly that know about been. Stockton because of the school shooting a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's Stockton has been known for shootings for quite a long time. Yes. Okay. So did you get to pay in-state tuition at Hastings? I don't even think that it was very different at the time. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure the... I, I can look it up really quick, actually. Um <laughs> Let me see. So for people who don't know, um, this is all a matter of public record. The American Bar Association standard 509 information reports are publicly available. And it's the best place to find um, all kinds of data about schools. But uh, yeah, I mean, resident tuition, 45,000 non-resident tuition. 51,000. So it's oh. exorbitant, ridiculously overpriced in both cases. It's not really a significant difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that um, time when I went to Hastings, out of state tuition was a little over $18,000. And I didn't think it was worth it. So that's why I dropped out of Hastings and just kind of enjoyed life in the Bay Area for a little bit before leaving. 
Oh, I didn't know that about you. Wow. Okay. Yeah. 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 But I, I was really mad. I thought about suing the law school, but then my, my friend who was at Yale law school, you know, told me, nah, don't waste your time thinking about suing the school. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's misrepresentation. You call yourself UC, but then it turned out they had their own residency rules that were a lot harder for people to pay in-state tuition. Yeah. So. And, and you know, they're not going to be Hastings anymore, right? No. What? What do you mean? They're changing their name? Yeah, because the dude that it's named after, the guy who's actually Hastings, mm -hmm. there's a small matter of him doing like genocide or, or funding oh. genocide. Sorry for laughing about that, but I mean, he did fund like army guys to go out and kill Native Americans. And so um, <laughs> they are now finally being forced to take Hastings out of the name. And it's going to be something like University of California, San Francisco Law School, I think is what it's going to be oh, called. Oh, OK. Well, that still sounds prestigious because people know of UCSF. So that, <laughs> yeah, it has nothing to do that. really with UCSF. It's the, um, you know, it's the, it's the uh, third best law school in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. OK. <laughs> Hastings is. Yeah. Oh, and here's yeah. one of your students who says he loved or he or she loved using LSAT Demon. Hey, oh, great. awesome. Yeah, thanks. That's <laughs> okay, great. Cool. So um, we wanted to first address, you know, why the LSAT is crucial. And of course, every so often, even on YouTube, you see some people claiming that, oh, you have a low LSAT score, no problem. Well, do you really want to go to a law school that will let you in with a terrible LSAT score and a ter terrible GPA? So, um, yeah. so anyway, would you like to speak on that issue? Why the LSAT yeah. is crucial? Yeah, well, the, the LSAT is the primary determinant of where you get in and also how much you pay to go to law school. And getting in is only half of the battle. I mean, it's a negotiation with these law schools uh, from the time you apply till the time you actually matriculate. And the thing that people don't really realize, but again, it's a matter of public record, is that the law schools are charging everybody a different price. So this is information that we get from their public American Bar Association 509 reports. And, uh, you know, to, to take Hastings, uh, since we, we've been talking about Hastings and I have the 509 report up right in front of me, um, it, currently at Hastings, 88% of the school is getting some sort of a merit based, uh, grant. And those grants are, um, really determined by LSAT and GPA. Uh, 51% of the class is getting something less than half tuition, uh, of a, for a scholarship, but 30 7% of the class is getting something half or more paid for uh, by the school. Essentially, it's a discount. But, you know, think about what's happening there. If 88% of the school is getting some sort of a scholarship, then that means there's only 12% of the school that's actually getting full price or paying full price. Imagine that you're in a class of 100 people and you're looking around and you're like, you know, there's 12 of you in that room of 100 who are actually paying full tuition. And then there's 88 people in the room who are paying something less than you are if you're paying full price. And if you squeak into law school, you're going to be paying full price or damn near, you know. Um, <laughs> they, they might make you, they, you know, try to make you feel good by giving you a $5,000 discount or something. I'm noticing here that the 25th percentile grant amount at Hastings is $8,300. Hmm. So they do, Ben and I on the Thinking LSAT podcast, we call them scammer ships where, <laughs> yeah. you know, they're, they're giving you, they're giving you money, but it's like, they don't even give you money, right? It's a discount. Yeah. So to make if, you feel good about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about it. If you get an eighty-three, if you get an eighty-three hundred dollar a year scholarship, and the tuition is fifty-one thousand dollars a year, then you're not getting eighty-three hundred. You're paying them 
43,000. And, um, you know, it's just like, they can afford to knock off $8,000 when they're charging you $51,000. So it's just fictional, right? It's, it's not the, the actual to Cause again, it, it is kind of a joke, right? The, the actual tuition is not 51,000 because again, only 12% of the class actually pays that number. Everybody else pays 51 minus some number between zero and all the way up to, and including full tuition scholarships. Um, why do law schools weight the LSAT so heavily? And, and do they weight the LSAT that heavily? Uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. We can predict not just admissions, but also scholarship offers with pretty high degrees of accuracy by just using your undergraduate GPA and your LSAT score. And the LSAT score counts a lot more than the GPA. Um, the reason why they do this, and we heard this from, you know, you know who Dean Z is, Judy, at, at uh, University of Michigan Law School? No. She's a law school dean who has a popular YouTube channel and is like really out there in the world talking to applicants and um, seems to be fairly forthcoming with the kind of analysis that she does when she admits um applicants to to University of Michigan Law School, which of course is a you know top 14 law school. And she says that the reason why she leans on LSAT and undergraduate GPA so much is that one, they predict whether you're gonna be successful in law school. And two, and this is a totally separate issue, the rankings agencies like US News lean pretty heavily on LSAT and undergraduate GPA when they're ranking law schools. So from a Dean of Admissions perspective, they're like, well, hey, look, I've got mountains of personal statements and resumes and these letters of recommendation and transcripts and all this stuff that, you know, it's really hard to quantify. But then I also have LSAT and undergraduate GPA, which when we combine LSAT and undergraduate GPA, they can predict more than 50% of your performance in your 1L year just using those two numeric measures. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they, and this again, this is all just public record. I'm not making things up. It, they, they have what's called an index calculation. And so I thought maybe you would be able to share this with oh, yes. um, the viewers. Is it and by there? the way, feel free, everybody who's watching to ask questions or whatever in the chat, I, I'm, I'm good on my feet. So if you if you want to ask me questions as I'm speaking, that's totally fine. But this right here, so this is this is the, the formula that law schools actually use and almost all law schools have have published this data. So basically it's, so what A is, that first column A is a just some weighting. They multiply that times your LSAT, then they add the next column is the weighting that they give to your GPA. And then the last mm -hmm. column is just some constant, which I think basically what they do there is they're just like trying, most schools seem to be trying to put your final number because it's, so it's A times your LSAT plus B times your GPA plus C equals one number. Mm. And most schools have it equated so that that one number ends up somewhere on like a 4.0 scale. So it seems like what they're doing is they're like, hey, let's take the LSAT and GPA and just turn it into a GPA. And then we can use that to evaluate applicants. Okay. Mm. So yeah. And, and it's public information. So this, so this is like, they're showing you really, um, you know, how the sausage is made. <laughs> they're, they're showing they're showing you like what their recipe is for uh, ranking candidates. But we took this information and we did some analysis to figure out how heavily they were ranking LSAT versus GPA. And mm -hmm. we were fairly shocked to find out that law schools, um, most law schools, and we got like 200 schools on this list. But most law schools are ranking LSAT somewhere between three and seven times as heavily as they're ranking, as they're weighting GPA based on these numbers right here. Mm -hmm. It's it's roughly to these schools, 
according to their own index formulas, which are public information, they're ranking LSAT three to seven times as heavily as they're ranking GPA. And those are the two by far most important components of your law school application. Mm -hmm. Okay, I put the link in the chat box so you guys can hopefully click on that or copy and paste or just yeah. Google Google yep. LSAC admission yep. index. Yep. The the second link that I shared with you before the show, Judy, is just a study that LSAC did. Now that's the Law School Admission Council, so you can say that they're biased or whatever because it's their test. Mm -hmm. But the Law School Admission Council did a study, and that's where they got all these regressions of how well LSAT predicts your um, first year performance. And the numbers there seem to support the idea that LSAT is actually a better predictor than GPA is. Even better than that is if they combine LSAT and GPA together, which that's why that's that's why the schools do what they do. They rank LSAT more heavily than GPA because LSAT's a better predictor than GPA. But LSAT and GPA together are a really good predictor of how well you're going to do in law school. Not perfect. It's not everything. It's not the only thing. But it's a really good numeric predictor. Like they can predict more than 50% of your grades <laughs> based on your LSAT and your GPA. So it's a really strong predictor numerically. Uh, and law schools lean on LSAT even more heavily than they lean on GPA. This is just, that's, that's the facts. Mm -hmm. the, the last thing that I wanted to share with people is our scholarship estimator. Um, so this form, um, let me bring that up. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So this form, uh, the, the scholarship estimator, what we've done is we've taken all of the public data from the American Bar Association 509 reports, and we've put it into this tool where at the bottom of the screen there, you can change, you can put in your undergraduate GPA and your LSAT score, and then you can hit update. And then using the public data, we can predict what your chances of scholarships are at all 200 of the ABA accredited schools. Again, this is just an estimator. It's not perfect. Of course, there's going to be outliers one way or the other, but we're just right now finishing up an admission cycle and we've got really good evidence that we do a good job with this estimator tool of predicting um, basically how much law schools are going to want to charge you to go to their schools. Again, it predicts how successful you're going to be in law school, which they're interested in. But the rankings agencies also use LSAT and GPA to figure out to, to rank the law schools. So the so if you're a dean of admissions, you're like, well, with LSAT and GPA, I can predict whether someone's going to be successful, which I'm interested in. And it's going to make my ranking go up or down, which I'm really interested in because I'll get fired if my ranking goes down. And so that's why these schools give um, crazy scholarships for LSAT and GPA. Now, in most cases, your GPA is fixed, right? You've already graduated. There's nothing you can do about your GPA. If you're a senior in college, there's very little you can do about your GPA. I mean, you're not going to change it like wildly, uh, especially you're not going to increase it wildly. And um, the LSAT, though, you can change a lot. And I would encourage everybody to play with this. It's at lsatdemon.com slash scholarships. That's where this estimator tool that I'm talking about lives. And at lsatdemon.com slash scholarships, you can play with various LSAT scores. Your GPA is probably fixed, but your LSAT isn't. And what we have discovered is that 10 points LSAT is worth $100,000 probably in scholarships. The thing I say all the time now is that one LSAT point is probably worth $10,000 worth of scholarship money. Okay. And well, <laughs> um, sorry to interrupt, but I, I'm no, having fun with this already. So I plugged Good. in mine and now I'm plugging in. Um, remember there was some guy that you guys talked about on one of your YouTube videos sure. where he could barely get a 150 on his practice LSAT and maybe like a 2.7 GPA. Yeah. And I think uh -huh. ultimately you guys both told him, uh, you know, we don't think you should go to law school. You're probably not going to go in, get into any place or any place that's going to be worthwhile. Yeah. I mean, with a 2.7 and a 150, if you scroll all the way down to Whoa. the bottom, 
I mean, you might start seeing some scholarships down there, but probably well, but, not. Yeah, but he probably won't even get into any place anyway, except maybe. The no, I disagree. Five. No, I mean, who knows? Let's see. So there's less than halves. Are there any more than half scholarships down there at the bottom? No. Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. Give it up. I mean, some people just really should not go eh. to law school. Yeah. Well, hey, uh, trust me. I, I never try to talk anybody into law school, but I also do not think that a 150 is the kiss of death. As if, if 150 is like your starting practice test score, I see people go from 150 to 170 all the time. And if you change that right there, Judy, I mean, you're doing it right now. If you change that 150 to a 170, oh, yeah. it's, it's yeah. you know, it's going to require some work. It'll require some time. But a 2.7 and a 170, like 60s. Let's see I bet you'll I bet you'll start to see some full rides. Yeah, maybe towards. Yeah. Again, toward the bottom, for sure. I mean, that 2.7 is not going to be looked at favorably by Ooh, most law schools. But there we go. School of law. Woo -hoo. Okay. Well, hey, at least you're not paying. Yeah. I mean, at least, you know, at least you're not paying tuition. Like, those are law schools that you definitely should not pay tuition for. But I know people who have become successful lawyers out of all of those law schools. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's it can happen. In fact, the people who are there on the scholarships are the ones who are most likely to be successful. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you could potentially still get a big law job if you're number one in the class or number two. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Wow. This is a great tool. I wish they had this back when I was applying. So. Yeah, I hope everybody checks it out. Um, there is information on there about how it works. I'm not sure exactly what the link is there, but um, there okay. there definitely is some. Um, oh, learn more. Do you see that next to the just kind of small, okay. but to the well, right of scholarship on, let me, estimator? Let me at least show the URL, lsatdemon.com slash scholarships. Yep. And yep. Nathan, you said you actually created this yourself. Well, not me, Ben. Oh. <laughs> All of my success is due to Ben Olson. Ben Olson is like the genius behind every. I'm just a humble LSAT teacher. Ben is the one who really um, is the genius oh. behind our, our whole website. I see the compliments on our website. Thank you, Tony. Um, yeah, the, the website is amazing and Ben manages all of our development. I don't do anything. I have some ideas from time to time, but Ben's the one who actually makes it happen. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't really do anything. Cool. So you want me to click on something to show people? No, I just wanted people to know that there is a learn more there. And if you click on that learn more, it goes to the methodology behind it. Also, the other thing I should point out is, do you see the column on the right there for 509 report? Do you see the, all the little PDF icons? On the right side of this website? On the Yep, it's under 509 report. It's one of the columns. It's a column of just Oh, oh little... yeah, yeah. Okay, now So I those see are it. the actual 509 reports. Wow. You click on one of those so that so that everybody can yeah. see what that looks Let's like. Let's see UC Berkeley since I went there for undergrad and they rejected me for law school. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Click on that. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Are you guys seeing it? No, it is not showing up. Okay. Oh, because it popped up in a separate window or something. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. The, those 509 reports, they look the same for every school. It's a standard uh, form that the American Bar Association requires law schools to publish. It's like a consumer protection thing. Mm -hmm. This is where all the public information is about each school that you're thinking of. But if you scroll, so see on the top there, Judy, on the right, you can mm -hmm. see the LSAT uh, and GPA percentiles. So that gives you a sense of like what kinds of people they're admitting to their school. Notice mm -hmm. that the uh, LSAT range is really narrow. All right. Mm -hmm. see, see how narrow those percentiles are? Yeah, I mean, 165 like, to 171. Well, yeah. I mean, and majority. the 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 50th percentile and the 75th percentile are like just only a couple points apart from each other, right? So you can tell how intensely interested they are in uh, LSAT from that mm -hmm. data. And then when you scroll down further, they kind of bury it down on the bottom of the second page is where they have all the scholarship information. Mm -hmm. And here's where you see how much people are actually paying mm -hmm. because you can see that at Berkeley, so they don't, they don't give nearly as many scholarships because it's Berkeley and everybody wants to go there, but they still are giving 70% of their class, some kind of a grant and 27% of their class is getting somewhere between half and full tuition. You mm -hmm. know, it's like that person got into Stanford and also got into Berkeley 
And then it's like, well, the only reason why in your right mind you would ever choose Berkeley Law over Stanford Law is if you're going there for a just crazy discount, right? I, in fact, I doubt anybody even makes that decision because Stanford is just like Stanford, right? And yeah. uh, Berkeley <laughs> is great, but not Stanford uh, for law school, so. Mm -hmm. Interesting, okay, well, this is great that um, you or Ben, you know, created this website. It seems like a real wealth of information. It so, is. And people yeah. need that kind of unbiased data to make an informed decision as to whether or not to sink all this money or take on yeah. young loans to go to a certain yeah. law school. Yeah, it's it's really kind of telling that those those 509 reports are they're mandatory, right? The, the American Bar Association requires that law schools publish those um, as a consumer protection measure. The law schools do not like hand it to you when you go visit the school right when you go you go like they give you the whole glossy brochure about their fancy clinics or whatever they're trying to sell you and that they, they don't like actually give you the consumer information <laughs> they give you a oh. bunch of other stuff but they don't give you that yeah oh i'm sorry um we missed a question that I think okay yeah let's do it back. so juanita is asking for the index how do you do the calculations again and what total is more favorable more favorable for universities. Well, higher is better, Juanita. And it's so it's just the column A times your LSAT plus column B times your GPA and then plus a constant, which really doesn't change anything. But it's just like that's all all you you can really learn from it is how heavily they're weighting LSAT versus GPA. The the best LSAT is uh, 180, right? And the best GPA is either 4.0 or 4.3. And what they're doing with those two numbers is they're they're equating the two. If they weighted the two equally, so 180 is um, four and a half times 4.0. Sorry for math. I know many uh, future <laughs> lawyers don't like math. But uh, if if they were weighting them equally, then the LSAT column would be 144 fifth of what the GPA column is because a 4.0 is 145th of 180. It, hopefully that makes some sense to people that if they were, if they were really going to just balance the two, they would have to multiply, essentially multiply LSAT times one and multiply GPA times 45 to put LSAT and GPA on a level playing field. But they don't. The, the number is actually more like seven or eight or something, which then indicates that they are uh, weighting LSAT vastly more heavily than they're weighting uh, GPA. You, there's no point, uh, Juanita, you, you really don't want to be doing that calculation yourself. There's no point in doing that calculation. Um, ben and I, I think, will probably publish our analysis at some point, and we, we're, we're planning to talk about it on a future episode of the Thinking LSAT podcast. So if you, if you listen to us on Thinking LSAT, you'll hear us talk about it more. And I think, it, it, you know, it's kind of interesting that they hide behind like 0.048 and then 0.349 and then some weird constant because they could just have one for LSAT and then seven for GPA or seven point something for GPA, at which point it would be clearer because it should be one to 45. And instead they've got these weird fractional numbers, which I... I God, I, cynically, it makes me think, well, they're just kind of trying to hide how how intensely focused they are on LSAT. But I don't know. It, maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But once again, you know, this is why the LSAT is crucial, because it it's just weighted a lot more heavily. Again, great point. Yeah. And, and really, we've seen it happen a million times. You improve by 10 points on the LSAT and all of a sudden a school that wasn't even going to admit you now is going to give you a full ride because mm -hmm. you you pumped up LSAT by 10 points. Yeah, or you go up five points and you get into schools that otherwise probably would have rejected you. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Um, or a school that was going to charge you full price now gives you a scholarship. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So this question came in quite a while ago, but I think Omar is asking about um, what effect going straight from K through JD, what effect does that play in law school? In admissions? Success? Zero. Yeah, in law school it's... success, 
Probably also zero, frankly. I, I don't think it really matters very much. That's my my opinion. But I mean, like, look at what the law schools are doing. They they give scholarships for your undergraduate GPA and for your LSAT. We can predict your scholarship based on your undergraduate GPA and your LSAT. So K through JD has nothing to do with it. Your resume has nothing to do with it. Your letters of recommendation have nothing to do with it. Your personal statement doesn't really, like we can, again, like it's just sort of like scoreboard, right? We can predict where you're going to get in, not perfectly, but in broad strokes, we do a good job of predicting where you're going to get in and how much scholarship money you're going to get based on your LSAT and your GPA. And then it's like nothing else really matters compared to those two factors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I'm sure it's also correlated to some extent to bar passage rates, but I don't know if they have those types of statistics on the LSAC website. Probably not. But you mean the K you through JD know. thing? No, no. I mean, in terms of, you know, your LSAT score predicting how likely you are to pass the bar exam. Yeah, the it predicts how successful you're going to be in law school and law school grades do a good job of predicting bar, bar passage. So, yeah, I mean, it's like they want to know whether you're going to win in law school or not. And uh, LSAT and GPA is the best numeric measure they have of those things. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, um, so what are what are some of your best LSAT tips? I mean, mine in a nutshell would be to take as many practice tests under time circumstances as possible, because that's basically what I did. Yep. Um, we are blessed with a hundred, roughly, give or take, a hundred practice tests are available. And you don't need to necessarily do all of them, but some of your competitors are going to do all of them. Um, Judy, as you know, lawyers work insanely hard. Mm -hmm. And because we have all of these practice tests available, it the LSAT becomes a test of how hard you can work. So on people's personal statements, they love to talk about how hard they can work. The LSAT is an opportunity for you to demonstrate how hard you can work by putting in the reps, learning as much as you can from your practice tests and improving your LSAT. We see people all the time improve by 10, 15, 20, 25, even 30 points. We've seen people improve over the last year or so. And so I, you know, I would, for, for, for one, I would tell everybody to be greedy. You want the very best LSAT you can possibly get because again, every point is worth like 10 grand. So don't give up, work really hard. As Judy recommends, do real LSATs. Don't do bogus made up LSAT questions because we have uh, roughly 10,000 real licensed LSAT practice tests or practice questions to work on. So do, do only the real licensed stuff. Timing is important, but not the way people think it is. Um, do timed tests, but do not race the clock. It's my number one by far tip for how to improve is that you can time yourself. Yes, but you basically should be ignoring the clock. Because the earlier questions on each section are the easy ones anyway. And you have to get paid for that work. You have to get those ones right. What we see people doing all the time, people who just crash and burn on the LSAT, they race through the easy ones. They make a bunch of casual mistakes so that they can get to the hard ones, which they might miss anyway, even if they had unlimited time. So we encourage everybody to flip that. We think that for today and for the future, you're gonna improve if you slow down, focus on accuracy, get paid for the work you're doing. You will still miss some questions, but then because you're missing fewer questions, your mistakes are of a higher quality. So when you review, it'll be like, hey, I'm used to getting these right. I normally solve these questions. I normally answer the questions correctly and get paid for the work I do. 
And now if I, if I miss a question, now it's like, oh, wait, what? I'm expecting to get that right. Let me really dig in and make sure that I understand why the right answer is right, why the wrong answer is wrong, and how I'm going to avoid making that mistake next time. Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Eventually, you'll have no problem with speed, but you have to slow down in the first place and get to a point of actual understanding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is a older question. We almost missed some of the questions. Oh, yeah, no problem. There were so many comments there. Um, my creation asks, Nathan, what about the schools that don't give letter grades where a lot of students get by on the name alone? Do you really think they care about your chances of doing well? You mean like Are, law schools that don't give letter grades like Harvard or Yale? Or yeah, do you mean undergrad? Yeah, maybe we can get a, a follow-up comment from my creation on that. Because I don't know if we're talking about undergrads that don't give letter grades. Sometimes LSAC converts your evaluations from like UC Santa Cruz or whatever. Oh, well, back in the day, UC Santa Cruz didn't give um, letter grades and LSAC would have to convert those. But I don't know, maybe my creation is talking about law schools. Oh, law schools. Okay. Um, well, it's certainly easier. And plus, you know, people already know if you got into Harvard or Yale, you're already a very smart, <laughs> cream of the crop, responsible, <laughs> diligent, hardworking. Gun yeah, and, and I, I have alumni at Stanford Law School right now, and I have alumni at Yale and Harvard Law School right now. Actually, I'm not sure if Yale, does Yale give grades? I don't know. Harvard does. No, they give honors pass yeah. or something. But so yeah. these are amazingly talented people. They're super smart. They're super hardworking. And just because those schools don't give grades, they have universally told me that they have never worked as hard in their entire life as they did during their 1L year at Harvard Law School or at Stanford Law School. Like they, they, they universally tell me, I got a 4.0 in undergrad, I got a 178 on the LSAT, I've been a top student my whole life, I've never not worked my ass off, but I didn't even know what hard work was until I started law school at one of these places. <laughs> so I think there's a misconception there that they're just getting by on their name. Like those people, if you're in at those schools, you are definitely gonna be working really super, super hard. Yeah, that's right. Serena asks, how different is the LSAT from law school? Totally different. <laughs> the LSAT is just a test. And then the law school exams are more like open-ended essays. Yeah. What are the reasons, apart from life events, why some people did well in the LSAT but don't succeed in law school and or as attorneys? Um, well, I, I guess I would push back a little bit like, sure, there's always outliers, right? But I do want to return to this idea that the single best predictor of whether you're going to succeed in law school is the LSAT. Like, there, there is no better predictor than the LSAT. So why are there exceptions? Because life is complicated. I mean, like, there's, ra there's, there's randomness for one thing. How are they different? I mean, you do have to, like, know things in law school. It's not like those exams are tests of memorization, really. But you do you, you do have to you have to actually learn law the lsat is not a test of knowledge the lsat is a test of skill so you practice the lsat you get really good at that game but it's not like you have memorized anything and there's no memorization at all on the lsat but there is some measure of memorization in law school um why don't some people succeed in law school and or as attorneys <laughs> yeah i mean What's the washout rate, Judy? Like 50%? <laughs> it seems it seems like that. Well, I mean, I, I did pretty high fairly well on the LSAT, but I didn't do that great in law school because it was just so hard to compete against all these cream of the crop college right. graduates, many of whom were from Ivy League schools, from yep. very rich families. Yep. You know, they were already connected. They came from families of lawyers. Um yeah, so it, it, you're used to getting good grades, right? Most people who go to law yeah. school, like they're not going to law school because they were a bad student. They're going yeah. to law school because they were a good student. And it's like, well, I've always gotten good grades. I know that I'm going to get good grades in law school. Uh, well, <laughs> hold on a second, because everyone else there is saying that exact same thing. Yeah. And in law school, there most schools are going to have a hard curve, right? Like Hastings, every class was required to be curved around a B plus. 
So the most common grade was B plus and half the grades had to be above that and half the grades had to be below that and the average grade had to be B plus. And so you would like just bust your ass and then you would get back your exam B plus. <laughs> and it's like, it, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's because as Judy says, the competition is just like so much more ridiculously hardcore than, and that's even at Hastings, which is like not that great of a law school. It's, a, it's okay, right? Like I said, it's the no, third it's, best school it's in pretty the Bay good. Area. I mean, especially it's okay. in California. But Judy, yeah. it's literally, you can see a better law school from Hastings. Yeah. <laughs> you can look across the bay and Berkeley. see the tower on campus at Berkeley. You can see it <laughs> yeah. from the Hastings campus. So it's like, okay, how good is the school really? If you can see a better law school from that spot, it's not that good. It's fine. Okay. It's a just fine regional law school, but it's nothing special. And still, smart, smart, super hardworking competitors. Like it is not easy, even at just a, you know, okay, middle of the road. What are they, 51st in the country? They can't be that great. <laughs> There's yeah, 50 well, better in the country. Well, when I was there, it was more like around 25 or something, but then around then it dropped to like 40 something. So everybody was like just going bonkers because Hastings had fallen so far sure. in the rankings. But um, yeah, but in general, it's because law school already draws out the cream of the crop or yeah. more of the top students. Totally. So, so the total doofuses aren't even going to get into these good law schools. So. Yeah, well, I was, I mean, so like I was a really bad undergraduate student, but then ridiculously off the charts LSAT, right? So for me, it's like lazy, but also really high horsepower. Mm -hmm. And so then weirdly, like I would get A's once in a while, just because I'm a really, really good writer, you know, like I would be able to come up with something just kind of pull it out of nowhere and get an A. And then the other people who are like these grinders, they'd like totally work their ass off and get a B plus. And it, so, yeah, it's just like, it is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that and question from Jonathan. Oh, okay. Oh, wait, there's the other, oh, there's, boy, there's so lots of questions. Let's, Thanks, let's guys. answer Juanita's question. Yeah, How yeah. close is the LSAT demon score percentile to the actual LSAT score percentile? I don't know what that means, Juanita. Yeah. Okay. LSAT demon score percentile. I don't. I mean, I, don't know I guess like when when you teach, are you using actual previously administered LSATs? Only. Or, yeah, that's all uh, we ever use. Okay, Nobody who's reputable in the LSAT game uses anything other than real LSAT questions because it'd just be such a waste of time, right? I, I mean, agree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, John. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you for being here. Jonathan had me on as a guest on his show. So. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. So how. He's an attorney in Pennsylvania. Um, okay. How often are the LSAT sections modified? For example, is logical reasoning still part of the LSAT? Do they still test mathematical skills? No, no math, right? Thanks for a great live stream. Um, I, I don't know that they, well, okay. So I only am familiar with the last, you know, 100 LSATs, which spans back roughly 30 years. Wow. And on none of those tests do they test mathematical skills. So it, it, it could have, I mean, but I have heard that it was like a different test in the 60s, 70s, maybe 80s. But since I've been doing it and we, you know, I started in 2007 and we had tests that went back into the 90s, early 90s. And none of those tests test math at all. Logical reasoning, is totally LSAT. They, um, during COVID, they, they weirdly dropped one of the two logical reasoning sections. It, it, it has been forever. One section of reading comp, one section of logic games, and then two sections of logical reasoning. And during COVID, and when they, when they converted to the online test, they actually just dropped one of the sections of logical reasoning and never explained it. They never, like no one ever even talked about that they had totally changed the balance of the test because when you drop one of the sections of LR, now it's only a three section scored test. So now games is one third of the test instead of one quarter of the test. So games is now more important. Reading comp used to be one quarter of the test. Now it's one third of the test. And logical reasoning, which used to be half of the test, which most of us agree logical reasoning is the most lawyerly of the sections uh, because you're arguing. Um, but that was half the test and now it's only a third of the test. So that, that balance has changed. The sections themselves have changed almost not at all. Like the games have gotten a little bit easier, but otherwise there have not 
really been significant changes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm nerding out that that's a that question was in <laughs> okay, my Okay, well, that's great that you that you know so much in detail about this test then. Yeah. Um, hey, I want to push back on this. You can absolutely see the tower on the UC Berkeley campus. If you go really? up into the high rise at Hastings, Where? you can see floor? the tower on the UC Berkeley campus. So you can literally oh, oh. see. Well, okay, Berkeley I'm sorry. From I'm Hastings. just I'm just an old fogey because now I remember they <laughs> renovated or remodeled or changed that main building after I left because yep. I left in 1996 or something. Yep. Oh, no, 1995 <laughs> fall fall of 1995 and then a few years later they did totally renovate that big building and do they still have that old dorm that's like right next to it the dorm building. the tower it's like the tower of terror right at disneyland yes my, uh, yeah. one of my friends lived in that in that dorm it was crazy i remember going to visit on like a friday saturday night and having the elevator doors open on like the second floor lounge and it was, it was literally like saturday night at 11 p.m <laughs> and it, the doors open and I just see nothing but Hastings law students studying <laughs> in, oh. the, in the door in the like lounge area on a Saturday night in the middle of San Francisco it was mm -hmm. at 11 p.m it was like holy these people are really really serious but yeah they still have it and they just built some giant high-rise like another high-rise but yeah you can see Berkeley from the from the tower too oh okay okay yeah okay <laughs> I will not dispute your <laughs> knowledge because I haven't been there in ages so okay so yeah. Phoenix of course asks you what I'm sure everybody asks you is did you practice after law school never did no nope. mercifully I uh, I had started my business while I was in law school and by the time I graduated I, my business was like off to the races I had full LSAT classes and it's all I ever wanted to do I never never wanted to practice. Mm -hmm. And do you teach people in person anymore or is it all virtual? I would love to. Um, I It'll be like for fun when I do it because we have students now around the world, um, like literally 10% or whatever of our students are in Canada and we, we just got people everywhere now. Um, the student improvement has actually been greater since COVID, since we were forced to move everything online we now we have classes in the middle of the day. Uh, we see people at work who are like, oh, I just went and got a conference room and now I'm here for this one hour LSAT class. I wasn't doing anything anyway at my fake job. So now I'm here in my, you know, working in my actual LSAT class and then I'll go back to these meetings later or whatever. You see people taking care of their kids. You see people cooking dinner. You see people, you know, like they they can integrate their LSAT prep so much better with their life online. As much as I loved teaching in a live classroom i just i i think it's dumb it's like a waste of time i mean people used to commute judy i had students come from fresno to take my class in san francisco oh, <laughs> it was like a three scary. hour commute you know yeah. and now instead it's like alt tab and you just go from a work meeting into the lsat class it's just wildly more efficient so yeah we're, we're never going back yeah maybe just I for fun i'll teach a class for fun and, and also like live stream it but no, we're, we're online forever. Okay, cool. Okay. So Jay asks, how do we identify good versus bad advice? I've come across books that force the student to go through pages of translation drills for logical reasons. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know what that but is. I can understand the stimuli more info on traps would be better. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't think, I mean, there aren't really any LSAT books that I would recommend I mean, I don't know yeah. what's out there recently, but I think getting a private tutor is really the best way to go. And I say this as someone who used to teach for Kaplan, and I totally hated the whole group concept, especially when people had just wildly divergent abilities on the practice LSAT. So I think getting a private tutor is the best thing that you could do. If yeah, you I disagree. Um, I try to talk people out of tutoring every time. I, I think tutoring is too expensive. We have oh. private tutoring. I have private tutor. You can pay me for private tutoring. I'll try to talk you out of it. I I think you should be able to get it done in my LSAT classes just as well as you can do it in in a private tutoring session for one tenth or less as much money. We have again, we do have private tutors. And if you have like really a lot of resources, then you can pay for good private tutoring. But even for those students, I would still recommend that they come to our classes. I mean, we 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 have so the demon is a self study tool where you don't even need the classes. Then we have live classes where you can go talk to me, talk to Ben, talk to all of our whole team of teachers. 
we have an ask button on every page so students can email in questions and they can get some help that way. Now you are getting help from like a professional in, in that context, right? You're getting one-on-one -on -one help via email that way. And in my classes, you're getting one-on-one -on -one help if you just participate. If you ask me a question and let me yell at you, then you, you get help that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I just, it's not in my best interest. And yet, I am always going to try to talk people out of tutoring. I, I think that, I really think people can get it done in, in our, at least maybe the way we do it's different, but I think mm -hmm. people can do it in a group learning environment. Okay. And my two cents. This. Okay. Is there any way I can figure out based on my score in March, how many questions I got correct? Yeah. Um, so you can look at the scoring scale. I mean, we have it at lsatdemon.com. I don't have a link to it directly, but you, you can look at a scoring scale. Uh, they're, they're public. The scoring scales barely change over time. It's not, not hard to find a scoring scale somewhere, but uh, yeah, you, you can just like reverse engineer it. <clears throat> okay. And Serena, as given that you don't practice, how has what you learned in law school helped you in your personal and professional life? Did you become a different person having gone through law school? Interesting question. <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, <laughs> like I, I really, I, we, we don't even have like an agreement with our students. Like we, we don't have people even, I don't even, I don't even like write a contract to have students like sign a contract when they sign up for LSAT demon. We don't use lawyers. We, we, we try as much as we possibly can to never talk to lawyers. Mm -hmm. Um, what I learned in law school was that if I ever had to, if I ever had to be engaged in any kind of law, like any kind of a legal dispute, I would have no choice, even as a law school graduate, I would have no choice but to go hire the best attorney that I could find in that practice area. <laughs> like I am not equipped as a law school graduate. I graduated from law school and I knew the, the only thing I had learned is how much I knew nothing. Like I graduated and I went, oh, so if I had a contract dispute, I would go hire a contract lawyer. Mm -hmm. I I learned enough to know that I would never try to practice myself. Did it make me a different person? I Bitter? <laughs> no. Well, I mean, I think you would agree, Judy. <laughs> the law schools love to say that it's a transformative experience, blah, blah, blah. You can do anything with a law degree. You know, they, they love to say you can do anything with a law degree. I firmly believe that you should only go to law school if you want to be a barred attorney. Like, Do you want to practice law? If you want to practice law, then OK, that's how you get there is you go to law school. But if you're like, oh, I want to be a better citizen or like I want to know more about our democracy or whatever, you, you could go on Wikipedia. You don't need <laughs> you really don't need to go to law school for that kind of a uh, purpose. My, that's my especially opinion. given the cost. Oh, and before yeah. I forget, I do want to also give a shout out to Nathan and Ben's um, video from about eight years ago or not eight years eight months ago where you were reacting to that wall street journal article about university of miami law school students and graduates who were deeply in debt so yeah. that discussion about debt and how long it's going to take you to pay off say like two hundred thousand dollars of student loans because of yeah. the interest i mean that's that's like a real cautionary tale that i feel like everybody thinking about law school. Oh yeah. We never it. stopped talking about that on thinking else at, we had a guest this, it's going to air this coming Monday. We had a, a guy named Derek Brainerd. He's a finance guy from access, Le access Lex. And he was basically just straight up acknowledging that if you're, if you're on income based repayment, if you go to law school, pay anything close to full price and you're not going to practice big law, your plan is essentially not pay back your loans. Like your plan is to get your loans forgiven because it's just it's just not possible like when people borrow a quarter of a million dollars and then they make fifty thousand dollars or sixty thousand dollars or seventy thousand dollars like you cannot it's just mathematically impossible to pay back your loans and so uh yeah i am a strong um advocate against borrowing uh ridiculous amounts of money unless you have a concrete plan for paying it back and i don't yeah. think trusting the federal government to keep these loan re you know loan forgiveness programs around i don't think that that's a good plan mm -hmm. yeah yeah so that's that's a very 
important message because sometimes people think, oh, well, I'm going to come out making one hundred eighty or two hundred thousand dollars anyway. So I'll pay off my debt in two years. But if, if you go to big law. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if, if you want to represent Exxon Mobil in legal disputes, that's just not what most people want to do. But that's the lawyers that make like crazy money. Mm hmm. Okay. And Tony is praising your website. Didn't you say Ben <laughs> was the one that did a lot of the website he, stuff? He didn't do the coding, but he he manages the developers. And we have a team of uh, freelance developers. Uh, one of the guys who did our design is a, one of the guys who apparently did this, the design of Spotify.com. So, or, oh. or maybe the Spotify app even. So yeah, that's how uh, it's, it's so awesome. But I have, I take no responsibility whatsoever. That's totally Ben. Cool. Okay. So what's this LR... Do you have any idea what that is? A logical reasoning loophole book? That must it's be something one new. Of the books out there. I mean, I, I really don't recommend any of the books, including my own. I, I wrote six LSAT books, and I don't think you should buy any of them because oh. all of those explanations have now been rolled into LSAT Demon anyway. And at LSAT Demon, we get feedback on the explanations and we update them all the time. Mm -hmm. printed books. I mean, we see so much outdated stuff. I know there's outdated stuff in my books. So don't go buy the Nathan Fox LSAT books. And in fact, don't go, don't buy anybody's LSAT books because everything now it, it's all, it's all, it's legit online. It, yeah. It's just so much easier to fix it. Okay. Why do you think the LSAT is such a difficult exam takes more time to study than most students initially expect? What can one do to make it easier? Focus on one question at a time. Like, you know, I, I see people keeping wrong answer journals. And I think that wrong answer journals are like an excuse for not actually understanding it. They like write it down. They take notes on it, but they don't actually understand it. I, I've got six questions for you, Serena, for every mistake you make. OK. Why is the right answer right? Why didn't you pick it? How are you going to avoid that mistake next time? Why is the wrong answer wrong? Why did you pick it? How are you going to avoid that mistake next time? So for every question you miss, you had to make two mistakes. You picked a wrong answer and you didn't pick a right answer. And what students do is they go too fast and then they think it's like, oh, well, you know, it's a, it's, this one's just better than that one. No, uh, -uh. it's not just that this one's better. It's that this one is actually right and this one is objectively wrong. This one answers the question. This one doesn't. And you need to take more time to get deeper into why you're making the mistakes you're making and, and really confront that mistake and take it seriously. You know, I can't help you when you go, oh yeah, I misread that one. It's like, okay, well, you, oh really? You misread that one and you misread that one and you misread that one. Or, you know, what did you misread the right answer that you didn't pick and you misread the wrong answer that you did pick? What, what are that's not lawyer behavior. So you need to slow down, take it more seriously, learn as much as you can from every question. And I think you'll find that the LSAT is actually not hard. I, I am committed to the idea that the LSAT is easy. Ben and I are working on a book called The LSAT is Easy. But you have to slow down enough to actually understand what you're doing. Once you slow down, you'll realize, I mean, hey, let's be honest. The LSAT uses dictionary definitions of words. It, it, it is not a trick. It means what it says. It says what it means. Yes, it uses convoluted sentences. Yes, it uses big vocabulary sometimes. But you're going to be a gladiator of the English language when you become a lawyer. And you need to start taking words seriously. The LSAT is a good opportunity to start taking every word seriously, reading it multiple times if necessary. Make sure you're understanding what it's asking. Make sure the right answer, make sure the answer you pick actually answers the question instead of just doing this like, oh, I don't really have time to actually understand. I'm just going to skim the surface and just like, oh, you know, could probably that one. That's not what we're talking about. It'll always be hard if that's how you do it. Mm -hmm. You got to stop doing it that way. Okay. So he's, Omar is saying many books and forums <laughs> added on a BS. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot so of he, bad advice out there. That's for sure. Yeah. So sometimes it's not good to get advice from other people that are also in the same boat. You know, yep. Just trust the professionals or, you know. Yes. 
don't listen to the other people who are also struggling with the LSAT. Is LSAT demon very close to the actual LSAT scoring scale? Well, but you said you use actual real previously administered tests, right? Yeah, for every previously administered test, Juanita, they, they issue the actual scoring scale. So we use actual LSAT scoring scales. Now, when they converted to the LSAT flex and they did the thing I talked about earlier, which was, you know, where they dropped one of the sections of LR, they didn't adjust the scoring scales when they did that. But roughly what you have to do is you have to multiply the old scoring scale times 75% because there's 75% as many questions, but we're still basing it on the old actual scoring scale and then just adjusting it down by, seven, by, by a little bit. So those are, those are real scoring scales. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my creation said, um, love the podcast. That's the one where Nathan and Ben were reading about law schools, essentially using poor minorities to pay for the scholarships of the richer kids. Yeah, I mean, let's not paint with too broad of a brush because, it, and it's not like they're doing that intentionally, but when they use LSAT and GPA to determine what scholarships they're gonna offer, well, there's a gap, there's a performance gap in undergraduate GPA uh, between whites and blacks and Latinos, right? And there's a performance gap on the LSAT as well. So if you're using LSAT and GPA as this hugely powerful determinant of how much you're going to charge people, then yeah, you're going to charge white people less. And uh, that's not their intention. I know that they didn't like that. They didn't plan on that. That's not their goal to do that. But uh, it is true that Blacks and Latinos graduate from law school with higher debt and Blacks and Latinos also have worse outcomes after law school. So they're charging people more for an inferior product, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, in fact. And again, they're not doing that on purpose, but that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I see. And getting back to LSAT, uh, what are your thoughts on power scores crystal ball prediction? disregard i mean ignore like what they 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 like try to predict what types of games are going to come we we don't even do game types at lsat demon like it's not that's not a thing that we care about so mm -hmm. it, it you know basically anything gimmicky that looks like a shortcut is not what we're going to be about we're going to be about are we actually understanding N nothing nothing about like you know let's let's ignore part of the test and just only focus on the part of the test that we think they're going to test tomorrow uh, that we don't think that that's a recipe for long-term success yeah yeah that's kind of kind of doofy just like when people try to predict what's going to be tested on the bar exam i mean what you still have to study why waste time trying to predict what specific topics are going to be tested yeah. Or not. So um, Nathan said not to buy any book on LSAT. Well, I think you should definitely buy those books from LSAC where they have the previously administered. But again, you don't need the books now because you, oh. the, instead they have LSAT Prep Plus, which you actually have to have an LSAT Prep Plus account to work with LSAT Demon or any online prep provider. You have to have a Prep Plus account and Prep Plus account gives you access to Law Hub, which gives you access to all the tests anyway. So you don't need to lug around those books. The test is online now, so there's no point in doing the tests on pencil and paper. You should definitely have the have the online access to the tests. Mm -hmm. Cool. OK, great. Well, it looks like we don't have any other questions. Um, so if you have a cool. quick question, please feel free to throw it in the chat box before we wind things down. Um, any other message you would like to put out there to the viewers? Um, well, let me get your take on online sure. law schools, because that got some people really riled up when I talked about online law schools and and saying that some law schools were scams and so well, some people we, get we really think upset that, about that. No, I mean, we think like roughly half of the ABA accredited schools just shouldn't exist. You know, we, we think that there are, they're, they're charging too many people too much money, right? If you look at like in California, for example, you look at the really low California bar passage rate and it's like, how can they justify continuing to charge people for three years worth of tuition when their bar passage rate for the last decade is like 50% or whatever. Like you're clearly ripping off half of the people who go to your law school and you don't give them a refund when they don't pass the bar. But I don't, 
I don't think that any, you know, I don't think that there is um, anything inherently wrong with the idea of online legal education. I think that all education is very likely to gravitate online. I, I just, our experience teaching LSAT online indicates that it's more efficient. So I don't know why, it, why, <laughs> for example, why would you build a gigantic new building in the middle of downtown San Francisco when you could just as easily, you, we've you've proven that you can do the classes online. Like there, there's just kind of no point in everybody commuting to a super expensive place to go sit in a lecture hall that you could replicate on Zoom really easily, right? And lawyers practice online, like judges, there's courts online. I don't know, do you, do you do any online yes. stuff, Judy? Yeah, All the time, yeah right? I just had a WebEx divorce hearing this morning. <laughs> okay, so if you can practice law online, then I'm pretty sure you'd be able to study online. That said, there are always going to be law schools that are going to be, you know, essentially predatory. I think you have to look at the bar passage rates of the schools and you have to look at how much you're going to pay to go there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I feel like if all you care about is to say that you have a JD, then yeah, do, do whatever you want with your money. I mean, at least the online law schools are a lot cheaper. Them, yeah, it's not like it teaches you to practice law anyway, right? You learn how to practice yeah. law once you start practicing law. It, it's a it's an academic competition that certifies you to sit the bar. And if you do well enough in that academic competition, then you're allowed to study for. You end up having to study for, by the way, like take a whole bar prep class after you already graduate from law school, right? So it's clear that they're not teaching you about the bar anyway in law school. So it's an academic competition and then you take the bar prep and then you take the bar. And now you're a baby lawyer who's going to go out and actually learn some area of practice. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't, I, I think, I also think law school should be two years, not three, or maybe even one year instead of three, right? It's like, just <laughs> well, well, why is that academic competition so ridiculously long? It's only so that they can charge you three years worth of tuition, it seems like. Yeah. And also, they, I think it's also good to kind of slow down the pipeline because there's already way too many people with JDs being churned out every year. So I totally, yeah. I have mentioned before that I felt that half the law school should be shut down too. And, you know, yeah. another commenter on my channel who can't find a job after going to a pretty well ranked law school, he also yeah. said, I feel like all the law schools should cut their class sizes by half course they're never going to do it so no yeah. not when they need to make the money i mean yeah yeah exactly. oh look at all these questions now yeah yeah now we have all these questions okay are you okay with staying on yeah i don't mind yeah sure. okay okay so nate is there a difference in the ease of going up in points um so 130 like 150 as 130... compared to a 150 and 170 i think so yeah it's easier at the bottom when you start with a very low practice score Maybe, maybe. Uh, I want to I want to say one thing about that, which is 130 indicates that you're understanding almost nothing. OK, 130 is like very close to random guessing. Illiter illiterate. Yeah, well, I don't want to be or mean about English, it, but I mean, it's like English. Yeah. It, it sometimes it is. Sometimes it is like really bad English, you know, especially we see people with English as a second or third language mm -hmm. or something. And if they're really, really struggling, it's like, well, wow, you, you know, your, your English is really holding you back. And I, I'm not an English teacher, so I don't know what I can really do to help you in that situation. Other times it's because people just, they never learned in undergrad to read carefully. They just are, they're just, they're like totally skipping off of the surface of it. Like they're not getting anything at all. And we do see students who just never improve out of the 120s even or 130s because they never like kind of come to Jesus with this idea of I'm going to slow down and I'm going to start getting the easy ones right. If you slow down and start getting the easy ones right, then yeah, I think you should make it from 130 to 140 to 150 like relatively easily. But it's also I, it's also pretty easy. Like if you score 150 cold, you know, first diagnostic test, cold 150. When I see a cold 150, I'm like exact opposite of that where I go, hey, cold 150 means that you basically understand what you're reading. And if you basically understand what you're reading, I see no reason why you can't get a 170. So I would say that it's roughly the same, except for I am worried sometimes about those people at the very low end who just, boy, they, 
they don't even, the problem is they don't realize how close to random guessing they are because mm -hmm. they get it right sometimes. And they're like, yeah, no, I understood that one. And it's like, really explain it to me. Like, why are those wrong answers wrong? Why is that right answer right? What's that say? And they have no clue. And it's, it becomes clear that they just essentially randomly guessed. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause really like, I think you only have to get like 35% of the questions right or something to get a 130. So you're, you're just mm -hmm. like really not getting it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If an applicant's LSAT score is lower than the median law school average, do you think acceptance is still possible? Yes, it, it can still be, right? Well, what's the definition of a median? Yeah, in the middle. The definition of a median means that half of the people at that law school got less than that. And, and you're asking the wrong question. You shouldn't be asking whether you can get in. You should be asking how much they're going to charge you to pay, uh, how much they're going to charge you to go there. Because mm -hmm. if you have below their median, then they're like, I'm worried that you can't cut it at this school. Also, it's going to hurt my online reputation as, or it's going to hurt my public reputation. Uh, it's going to lower my median. If you're below their median, then you have a tendency to lower their median. And if you lower their median, then you tend to lower their rank. So they're like, well, I'm worried that you can cut it at my school and you're going to make me look bad in US news. So I might admit you because half my class by definition has lower than my median, but I'm also going to make sure that you're the one that's footing the bill because I have to give scholarships to people with higher than my median because I have to raise my reputation. And because I know those people are going to succeed in law school and do good on the bar and become like actual attorneys. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the real scary thing about this game is that the people that are below the medians pay the whole bill and have way worse outcomes. Mm -hmm. Okay. If, if you do classes online, I'm wondering if it helps you when you have to actually work in person as an attorney. I don't think it makes a difference. I think it just has to do with the individual's personality because, you know, you still have to have people skills and be able to talk to people, you know? So, yeah. I, don't, I, don't I mean, wouldn't you say that most legal work is just written work anyway? Like you win yeah. or lose based on briefs, right? You don't, you, it's not... Mm -hmm. Well, it kind of depends because, you know, for me being a solo practitioner, I do have to interact with people all the time. You have to do like business development and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it really depends on what kind of law you want to do. But in general, it, it does help if you can at least talk to people without freaking out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh? Johnny Depp? Huh? Oh, I'm so sick and tired of hearing about Johnny Depp. So, okay. <laughs> I wonder if the education is the same online. Well, I mean, I in a way, I kind of feel like it makes it more engaging and more likely for you to pay attention if you're actually there in person with the professor. But I would have always thought that until I started teaching online. And I got to say that the, the student outcomes are better, like way better mm -hmm. since we moved online. So oh. for whatever it's worth, I mean... It, I used to, I, I mean, I resisted it. It was like COVID is the only thing that forced me to start teaching online. And when I was forced to start teaching online, the student scores shot up. So uh, it's more effective, at least in for what I do. Mm -hmm. Great. Do you have older students who take your LSAT class and graduate from law school that still stay in touch with you? How are they different in terms of outcome? Thanks very much for sharing. Um, I connect to people on LinkedIn, you know, um, but I don't notice really any difference. I, I don't, I don't know. Law school, once you're, it's like you went to wizard school, you know, once you go to law school, now you learn these magic incantations and you, you go off and become a wizard. And also you work 70 hours a week as a wizard. You're not really having time to communicate back to your old LSAT teacher. So I haven't, I don't know. I haven't seen any difference, I guess. Yeah, but did the students at least come back to you right after they take the LSAT and tell you how they did? All the time. Yeah, we get emails all the time. I mean, th that and they love to report their scholarships. You know, yeah. like they'll, people come back and like, I got a total of a million dollars worth of scholarships this last cycle mm -hmm. and I'm going to this school on a full ride and I'm super excited. Yeah, that we that's very rewarding when we hear that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Do bar passage rates matter? A few schools I like don't have the best bar passage rates. Sure, I, I'm sure it matters because why would you go to law school if you can't even pass the bar exam? And But I, I think a lot of it doesn't really have to do with the school itself, but the quality of the students that they're willing to admit. 
Oh yeah, of course. And if you go to like, let's say you're going to get a scholarship to go to Golden Gate or a scholarship to go to Southwestern or whatever, these are schools that have low bar passage rates compared to their peer schools. But if you're there on a scholarship, that's because you have better LSAT, better GPA, better chance of succeeding on the bar. So, you know, don't, it's not like the school actually prepares you for the bar. And like Judy said, it's a selection bias thing. And uh, yeah, I mean, like if the bar passes rate is 50%, that means half the people there are not going to pass the bar. But if you're there on a scholarship, then you're probably in the top 50%. Yeah, most likely. Yeah. Okay. Why not go back to the law office study program at students? I don't know what that is. I don't know what that means. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, if you're talking about how law students should really do some practical experience, I mean, that I totally agree with that. But a lot of law schools, by third year, they do have clinics or they put kids or I shouldn't say kids, put students in externships where they can actually get some real practice experience. So, um, thanks, Nate. I'll be taking the LSAT beginning of cycle and will definitely earn a score higher than my top school's median. Okay, Great. good. Okay, go for I like it. the optimism. Yeah. That's Good awesome. Luck. Yeah. yeah. Um, how is law school different from the practice of law? It's totally different because in law school, you're just kind of like sitting there passively in a big lecture room or in a big <laughs> classroom with a bunch of other people while the, the law professor just kind of, you know, performs in front of you and keeps talking at you. Right? It's an academic competition, right? I mean, and even what happens in the lecture is almost irrelevant to your grades. Because really, your grade's going to come from your exam at the end of the term anyway, not from whether you said something like super brilliant or or said something stupid in class. Like your participation can, it, participation can kind of change, but the exam is like what actually is where your grade comes from. So the school is not even related to the evaluation. And then totally separate from that is actual legal practice. I mean, they're not the same at all. People graduate all the time, right? Was it you, Judy, that was talking to us about how you graduated and then you realized like you didn't know how to go to court or you didn't know how to yeah. file a brief or you didn't know yeah. how to do anything? I had, <laughs> I had no practical skills, even though I did take some of those like 3L practice classes about civil litigation or discovery or yeah. depositions and, you know, advanced criminal procedure and stuff. But really you just end up hoping that you work for a place where they will teach you on the job. Yeah. It's, it really has nothing, very little to do with the practice of law. And in fact, as I've mentioned in one of my old videos, most of the law professors never even had much of a legal career before they went to yeah. academia because most of them, you know, went to Ivy League schools and maybe clerked for a judge for a year yeah. or two and did big law for a year or two. And then you know, published a bunch of law reviews. Yeah, they tend not to be the best teachers, right? Like they just do this, like they want to just go through the like appellate cases and do this whole big like highfalutin theoretical <laughs> stuff. Meanwhile, your adjuncts, like mm -hmm. the ones who are barely getting paid, but they're actual real lawyers. The adjuncts yeah. are the ones who like are, I kind of, I thought I found them to be on average. I thought the adjuncts were much better like actual teachers because they're like talking about their legal practice. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So um, so that's that's the huge disconnect between, you know, studying for the LSAT and then going to law school yeah. and then suddenly being thrown to the wolves when you graduate and you're supposed to be a practicing attorney. So, yeah. yeah. What are the scholarship prospects for like for no UGPA internationals with a strong LSAT? Are we ignored? Do we need to do something else to appear attractive regarding competing for scholarships? I mean, they already were going to weight your LSAT somewhere between three and seven times as heavily as they were going to rate your GPA. That's what the index formula tells us. And if you don't even have a GPA, then they don't have to report your GPA. They can't learn anything about your promise as a student from your GPA because you just don't have one. And so they're going to just lean even more heavily on your LSAT, but you can still show them a really good LSAT that makes them think that you can cut it and you can still raise their median with a high enough LSAT. So uh, yeah, if you don't have a reportable GPA, I think it's just like makes your LSAT that much more important. And that's really the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. 
Do you think law schools give those types of scholarships to students from other countries, though? Yeah, I mean, we've never seen any evidence against that. I mean, I oh. think that there might be some state schools that have like policies against it, but mm -hmm. I've never heard of I, I've never I've never met an international applicant who was like, yeah, I wasn't able to get scholarships because of my international status. I don't oh. think that's a thing. As okay. far as I know. Okay, cool. Okay, well, yeah. well, my creation again says demon help me. Wow, 20 plus points. Okay. Yeah, oh, I'll pay you kickbacks after the, after the live stream. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> great endorsement here. Yeah, tell us what school you're going to go to if you can. So yeah, yeah, thanks for being here, Jay, and asking so, you all asking such great questions and stuff. Well, wow, we've already gone 20 minutes over the hour. So maybe we should wrap things up. Okay. Um, yeah, it's been a long week, so I'm kind of ready to get ready to call it a day. But um, thank you so much, Nathan. If you'd like to just stay on for a minute so I can say goodbye to you, we'll say goodbye sure. to our viewers now. And um, so if people have any questions to you, should they just contact you guys through your website? Or your uh, yeah, or? we're LSATdemon.com, the Thinking LSAT podcast, LSAT Demon Daily podcast. My email directly is Nathan at lsatdemon.com. I'm always looking for feedback, uh, Nathan at lsatdemon.com. If you have questions about LSAT Demon specifically, we have the best customer service team. It's help at lsatdemon.com. They are awesome. Um, so questions about pricing or discounts because of uh, LSAC fee waiver or we also have a really, really robust free program. Um, so go to lsatdemon.com and sign up for a free account. You'll start right away get, being able to watch videos, read written explanations, get invited to live classes, um, all kinds of stuff with a free account at LSAT Demon. Okay. Are you guys also on Facebook or, or Twitter, Instagram? I, I don't think Twitter, we do, we're definitely on Instagram and I think maybe they're gonna start putting some stuff out on TikTok. I, for mental health, I quit yeah. basically all social media like years ago, and I am very happy. That I did that. Yeah, so it can get. Anything. Yeah, it can get to just so overwhelming. I mean, you have your real work to do and your students and stuff. So why get distracted yeah. dancing around on TikTok to music? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like yeah. like rapping about the LSAT or something and dancing and twerking. Yeah. You're giving me all kinds of good ideas, Judy. <laughs> okay. Well, it is always kind of funny to me when I see older attorneys and they're trying to do stuff like on TikTok or whatever. <laughs> I'm like, uh, okay. Yeah, that's not going to be me. I try to stay off of TikTok and really try to stay off social media. So, okay, thank you guys out there, whoever's planning on taking the LSAT or thinking about it, you know, hopefully you'll look into LSAT Demon and wish you guys the best of luck and tune in next Saturday, the next live stream show, I will be bringing back my friend Dominique Williams, an attorney in Raleigh, who's going to be talking with me about different legal practice areas and the different legal jobs that we've had. So I think people are very interested in those types of like legal job content. So thank you so much, Nathan. I really appreciate your time. Hang out. Thanks, Judy. Anytime. Thank you.